basically, I will talk about three examples of research we have done in the last uh, two years in Barcelona, so where we have the European lab of, of Yahoo. And as uh, so Stefano said, the wisdom of crowds. So what people do can be used to enhance the web. And I will try to convince you of that. So this is the, the outline of the talk. First, I will talk about the power of data, which is the same of the wisdom of crowds. Then I will go through three different examples. And, and you will see why it's so powerful. So how you improve image search and, and give you a specific example, faceted clusters. Also about searching the Wikipedia and I will give you a, a specific example called correlator. And then I will, I will go to the most interesting one which is my own er line of research is understanding queries. And there I will give you another example called search path. So basically all these examples not only impact the search quality, but also the user interface. You will see that, but I will not talk about that. I mean, we're not experts on, on human computer interaction, but I think there's a lot of things that you can do when the experience of the user changes, and then you can try to, to do something better for the, that person. Please, if you have some important question in the middle, stop me, and if I'm going too fast, the same. So let me start with some uh, numbers. So these numbers are already old, but there's nothing else out there. So this is a paper of uh, two colleagues of mine at that time, Raghura Makrishna and Andrew Tompkins. So one database expert and one search expert. And they try to uh, estimate the amount of data inputted every day in the web. So how much you do in the web, how much organizations do in the web. And so for example, published content, so organizations, is about three, four gigabytes per day. I will look at this in particular. User generated content, the web 2.0, 8, 10 gigabytes per day. Well, private text content, everything produced inside organizations, they estimated in three terabytes per day. Uh, but also if they, if you think all people doing say eight hours of uh, content generation per day, you can get to 700 terabytes per day. That's in 2007. Please don't do it. We have enough with three terabytes private or with uh, say one terabyte public. But that's the po possible power. In particular, we will look at metadata. And two that are important here, tags. So people tagging pictures, tagging videos, tagging text. At that time, they estimated in 40 megabytes per day Maybe today it's 100 megabytes per day. And page views, people doing things on the web. You can think that this is the implicit web 2.0. Every time you use the web, you are generating some content, the content of what you want, what you're interested, and so on. And I will get back to that in the later example. So let me look at this, uh, uh, all kinds of data you have in the web. So I will divide them in, in explicit semantics. So data where you have some explicit semantics like metadata and implicit semantics like say normal text. So the first one in explicit is metadata, lots of metadata of every kind, very well structured, maybe incomplete, maybe false, but still there. Second, for example, a lot of uh, RDF, so the language of the semantic web. Very structured data, very well organized. And now today is more than what you think. So Yahoo was the first company that crawled RDF and uh, other kinds of metadata in the web to do something, for example, to do search monkey and other things that are related to uh, improve structured data in the web. And we have a project called Web of Objects. We are doing that, but uh, this, top, this talk is about a different thing. Then you have things that you, you uh, surely know from the classic Web 2.0, like Wikipedia, the Open Directory project, which is the, uh, like the Open Directory, Yahoo Answers, so people answering people. Yeah, it's amazing. Some people have time to answer other people yeah, when they are not doing assignments. And you notice already 
that you have a different font size. So um, this is not easy, but the font size is like an earthquake scale. And coming from Chile, I know that scale very well. So it's a log scale. So every point size is one order of magnitude, say order 10. So metadata is larger than RDF, and RDF is larger than Wikipedia, and so on. So for non-computer people, you have to imagine the log scale and that. So the next example is Flickr. So the best example of a pure folksonomy, the best example of a site that allows people to tag data, and so on. And why is it separate? Because here we can draw the line between taxonomies and forthonomies. So these are categorized by taxonomies, so fixed hierarchies, and these are categorized by forthonomies, flat hierarchies decided by people. Here is hierarchical uh, structure decided by some editors. What's on the other side, or the main one, the biggest one, text? Then you have anchors and links. You can think that every anchor, so anchor is, anchor is the text on a link. Every anchor is like a tag. So you, you link to a page, and this is like a tag that you are using, or a set of tags for that page. So this is in the web. You see the anchors and links are bigger than metadata. Then you have queries and clicks. So you can think again that every time you query, say, Politecnico di Milano, and you click in the Department of Computer Science or Electronica, then you are tagging that page with your query. So this is implicit tagging. So you can see there's implicit web 2.0 there. Now, I'm cheating here because that's not in the web, right? Queries and clicks is through search engines. So this is per day. It's not in the web. This is how much is per day. If you do it along history, it will be larger than any font here. It will be larger than the screen. And then for people that know, uh, say, natural language processing, WordNet, one of the best semantic resources out there, will be very small in this same scale. So several orders of magnitude less than metadata and more of text. So a few important remarks here on this world of data. So the first one is that after the American online incident in 2006, queries are very private. Because basically, query has a privacy risk, and you can infer people even from anonymous query logs. Because people, um, for example, people do vanity queries. They ask for their name. They look for a drug in their postal code. They look for a schedule of the bus in their neighborhood. And when you cross all that data, there's only one person that can be, that person that lives in this place. The other problem is the scale. Yeah, all the rest is public. But not all people can uh, buy, say, 10,000 computers to crawl the web in one week, right? The computer is cheap. The bandwidth and operation of that is much more expensive. So today I will look at this Web 2.0, including queries and clicks, this implicit Web 2.0. So basically, I'm, I'm looking at user-generated content and queries and clicks. And there are many other interesting problems here. The main one is quality. How good is this data? So clearly, edit edited content is much better than, say, the Web 2.0. So a good page from, say, Cyclopedia Britannica will be much better than the Wikipedia. However, for the same level of quality, there's so many people putting content that you will have more Web 2.0 content than edited content. So what I'm saying, is that the Wikipedia will be so large that at the same level of quality will be better than Britannica. And a lot of research to do, to, to do that for web spam, reputation, and so on. And what is behind this? The wisdom of crowds. So basically, the knowledge that people put when they were writing text, when they are linking pages, on where, when they were using the web. And this comes from a book published in 2004 by a New Yorker journalist that says, under the right circumstances, groups are remarkably intelligent. Right? Right is the problem. So democracy should be the best example of this. And I think I shouldn't talk about this topic here. Right? <laughs> <Okay>. Wrong country. <laughs> 
or maybe I should, I don't know. <laughs> but I will talk about computer science. So this book is not about computer science. This book is about how people can uh, infer or deduce things better than one person. So it's trivial that all of us know more than Stefano, right? But how we put all our brains in one big brain that is better than Stefano because his brain is in this big brain. But I, that, I, I don't know enough biology to solve that problem. But in the web, you can do these things. And this importance of diversity, independence, and decentralization. So the key issue is how to aggregate data. So these words. And as usual, aggregating data, you can do good things, and you can do also things that you shouldn't do. So a very simple example. You go to Flickr. Flickr has a functionality called clusters. And I use the tag Milano. And I get these four nice clusters of Milano. So the first one is clearly about the city. So Milan, Italy, Italia, Duomo, Milano, because this is the common tag. So it's in English and Italian. And then you have uh, about music in Milano. So live, concert, concerto music, musica, and so on. Also, there's something about photography, because it's uh, black and white in both Italian and English. And then you have uh, something about the nice sky in Milano. Hmm? There's no image processing here, nothing. Only tag clusters. So you are using text clustering to infer the image clusters. And this works very well. Hmm? In the case of Milano, it's not so interesting, because Milano doesn't mean too many things. But if you do any ambiguous word, you will get the right cluster. So Jaguar, you will get the car, you will get the animal, you will get the guitar, you will get an uh, aircraft. So what do we will get using this aggregation of data coming from the web? So we will get basically four things. So the first one is popularity. Popularity means what most people is watching, right? Because the web is another communication media. The only difference is that it's interactive. So it's like television. So what's, uh, what's people watching now in Italy? Garbage, OK. That, that's a possibility. But still, they're watching it. <laughs> so the last reality show, right? So you have to watch it, because then you can talk to people, even if it's not good TV. The same happens in the web. What's popular doesn't mean it's good. It means many people is watching it. So this is the head of the, the head of the distribution. Most people is looking at here. And then you have diversity because of the long tail, many people watching other things. Quality, some people find the best stuff, some people create the best stuff. And then coverage, because of the long tail, you cover everything, all possible knowledge, all possible places in the city, and so on. So recently, in a CIKM paper, uh, some colleagues of mine, Andre Brother and his team, show that people is ordinary people with extraordinary taste. Because you can explain this by two, two ways. First, you can say, OK, uh, most people is normal, and they only see popular things. And most people, some people is special, and they see strange things. You, you can change the adjectives. Right? Well, the other possibility is we are all normal and all special. Thanks, we are the second. So we all see popular things, but then the combination of our extraordinary taste will make the long tail. So we are both in the main part of the distribution and also in the long tail. So we are all special in some places, in some topics, in some things that we like, hobbies, and so on. So let's look at uh, cover. So uh, again, I will use Flickr, another example from Flickr. So this is about geotagged pictures from Flickr. So today, or yesterday night, there were 250,000 pictures from Milano, tagged Milano, with geotagged information, so with geographic information. So we know the location where the picture was taken. Of, of course, the location of the photographer, not the location of the, of the picture. And if you click in any of these examples here, I click here, you get, for example, this very nice picture of the Duomo de Milano with uh, very nice clouds. Mm -hmm. 
And you can see a sample, so this picture was taken here, the sample of where people is taking pictures. So you can't see this 150,000 will be too much. But for example, in, in the last web conference, we presented a paper where we can use this wisdom to, pre to uh, suggest a possible way to follow the streets of Milano to see the most interesting places that people think we should see. So that's like a touristic trail. So this is another example. I will not talk about this example. But there's another wisdom of crowds. Hmm? So this is very important. Basically, information retrieval was born with Salton and the concept of TF, term frequency, and IDF, inverse document frequency. So how people use words. How many times you repeat a word. How different words are used in documents. And this was crucial for ranking in the first, I would say, well, the first 40 years of inform information retrieval. So from the 60s to, say, 97. With the web, there was a hypertext, partly hypertext, appear links, say, hits, page rank. And that was the wisdom of the webmasters. So the 98, that worked very well. Today, anyone can put a link. So all of us are webmasters, thanks to Web 2.0. So it's not working so that well. Then with the Web 2.0, we have the wisdom of the taggers. And I, I already showed you that, but I will get back to that. And then we can go one step forward. Implicit Web 2.0, implicit tagging. The wisdom of all the users. Because we all, all query and we all click in different links. Uh, so for this, uh, we will do two assumptions. First, that when you are querying, you are thinking. It's a very strong assumption. And then when you are clicking, you are not trying to spam. You are really trying to find what you want, trying to get to the website that you want, trying to interact the web the way you want. And the good thing is that most people uh, fulfill this assumption. So let's go to the first sample, the wisdom of, of the targets. So for the people who have been in, in Barcelona, this is one of the main landmarks, the main work of Gaudí, so the Sagrada Familia. So you can collect the tags. The tags are in Spanish, in English, in Italian, in Japanese, in Chinese, in all languages. And then you, you, you will derive a collective knowledge about, for example, Sagrada Familia. It's about Barcelona, it's about Gaudí, it's a church, it's, it's, it's about architecture in all languages. Here I have English, but it's in all languages. And that's very important. It's language independent. And then you can say, OK, can we structure pictures in a different way so the experience of looking at pictures is better? And you can say, OK, let's cross tag information with the WordNet, with Wikipedia. What will happen? And we did uh, last year a demo called Tag Explorer so that you can use this in, in, in the website for demos of Yahoo Labs. It's called sandbox.yahoo.com. And this is basically an infinite browser of images where you have pictures organized by three <coughs> topics. So where, what, and when. And then you have things like location, subjects, names, activities, time, and so on. So if you cross this tag data with, the, with WordNet, you get this distribution. So the red one, the biggest one, is location. So the most used tag is the location, the city, the place, and so on. The second one, apart from the other, is artifact or object. And the third one is person or group. And the fourth is action or event. So you have entities here. I will get back to that. Entities of place, entities of name, entities of time. And the good news is you can cover 52% of the tag volume. That's not the same of saying. 52% of all different tags is the volume. So you can cover the head of the distribution of tags. You can throw the Wikipedia, and you can get up to 68% coverage. So the Wikipedia, you get some tags that are not in the WordNet, that are more specific, for example, different languages. And also, you can show that you cannot do better than 78.6% because not all pictures are tagged. And then this is about 80% of all tags, which is a very good coverage. And because you have the wisdom of crowds, 
is enough to cover almost everything. So this is an example. So I'm starting here with the query Duomo. And of course, if you ask Duomo, you will get places in Italy. And one of the main ones is in Milano. So here, if you click in a, in a picture, you get this. So you don't go to another page. You get a bigger picture and then the, the tags. So you see here Italy, Milan, Italia, Milano, Duomo, Old City, Lombardy, Super Masterpiece. masterpiece. This must be a special tag of this person. And then you get this categorization. So time, there's no time here to be time, but you get locations like Florence or Firenze. It's language independent. We don't doesn't understand languages. Subjects like cathedral, church, names, and so on. And here you can click in the green cross. Then you add that tag. So you can go to the Duomo of Firenze, or you can go to the Duomo of Milano. You can click on the red tag. Then you delete that tag. Or you can click in a tag. Then you add that tag. So now you click uh, forever, and you see relations on the tag. You cannot, you don't need to query again. So that's why I'm saying it's infinite browser because uh, Flickr has more than 100 million pictures. What you can do with this? So one thing you can do is to have a very nice interface like this when you uh, upload the picture in Flickr. So for example, the person has said, this is about the London Eye and the Thames. And here the system says, okay, these are other related tags like London, England, UK, River, South Bank, Big Ben, Bridge, and the person will click all the ones that are related. Hmm? We cannot use this. Why? Because uh, the, if you remember SIF and the famo famous book on, of the minimal effort, the law of minimal effort, the students know that, right? So how to pass a course with uh, exactly the needed mark. I, I did it too, so don't worry. <laughs> All, we all do. We have to live in a world where you have more things than time available. So what will happen? In three months, all the tags will be suggested by the system because people will use it. And then we will not have a full sonomy. We will have a machine sonomy. Machine sonomy biased to the algorithm that we're using for the tags. So Flickr people said, no, no. I mean, we're pure full sonomy. No way. So how we can use this? Well, we can use it for other things. For example, diversity, topical diversity. We want to find images for all the different meanings of Jaguar, for example. So the car, the car is the main meaning, sadly. The animal, the Apple computer, again the animal, again the car. But even in the same concept, we want visual diversity. For example, Jaguar X-Type is about the car. No way, it's about the animal. But there we want the front, the inside, the back, and so on. We want different images. We don't want the same image of the same car in the same position. And also you can think about the spatial diversity, temporal diversity, social diversity. So with tags, we can improve this. We can go one step further, and we can use annotations. So annotations is very nice people that put a square rectangle over part of a photo and they tag that. For example, here they say telephone booth. Yeah? Thanks to that person, we know that that's a telephone booth. And now we can do very good image search because anything that is similar to this should be a telephone booth. So please put meaningful things. Don't put velo. Yeah? Wow, amazing. That doesn't help. There are too many amazing things in the world. So here we use a standard state-of-the-art technology, so SIFT. So basically you build a vocabulary of edges in the image. You transform that to numbers. So you have like a small word that represent shapes of images. And then you can use this to do better search, better image search. And here it's interesting because we will use the, uh, the wisdom of crowds example inside the algorithm, not only on the data. So how we do it? So first, you search in the visual annotations. For example, you search cocaine. So we will do tag search. We will use search in the tags. And suppose we find 
100 different annotations. And using some kind of ranking, these are the top three. The top three annotated things with code kind. And now we'll do image search in these three. So we'll find similar things to this, similar things to this, similar things to this, and then we get this. Here we're using wisdom of crowds. Why? Because we are finding similar things to here, here, and here. So you can see that this, each set is one different person or one different algorithm. Then you combine this, for example, using board account. There are many ways to combine this uh, ranking. And for example, you get that the top one is here because that appears, for example, in the two places here. And also you delete all the mistakes because those will have maybe support in one list, but they will not have support in the other list. So basically, here you want to show two things. First, that ranking aggregations, so using the wisdom of crowds at the internal level works. And second, when you combine tag-based information with image-based information, you can do, do much better. This was a paper presented in ACM Multimedia Information Retrieval about one and a half year ago. So this is what you get. So this is using just images. Not very good. So this is the precision. So 0.8 means that eight, the 80% 8 of the answers up to say five or 10 are correct. Using only tags, you get the red one. So tags provide more semantics than images. Because you are searching in words that have semantics, images are much different, difficult to extract the semantics. For example, red sun with a red ball, very hard to distinguish. However, if you do the wisdom of crowds at the image level, you get similar to the tags. So this is the blue line. So just aggregating many instances of this, you get to the tag level. So this is three instances. However, if you put the two things together, so this is the last, the, the everything, you do much better. You get 80%. So this means that the wisdom provided by this is different from the wisdom provided by the red line. It's almost the sum. So these are different sources of evidence that work very well. So you can do faceted image search. Here you see automatically places that are important in the city. So Galleria Vittorio Manuel II. No? Piazza del Duomo. The Duomo. Teatro. Santa Maria de Gracia. Castello Sorsesco. Porta Romana. I have been in all those places. I know they're interesting. All this automatic. And then you get images from there. But this is important because you click here and you get only pictures from, say, Galleria Vittorio Emanuel. Ranking here is interesting. You will see that there are more pictures from the Duomo Cathedral than Vittorio Emanuel, but then you can distinguish why one thing is better than the other, and doesn't depend only on popularity. So this is Buenos Aires. I, I was there giving another talk last week, so that's why I have that. And well, the same, again. Uh, by the way, also you have this nice uh, query completion. Yahoo was the first one to do query completion, even in images. If you go to yahoo.com and search query, uh, images, you will see query completion, completion on the images. So let's go to the second example. And the second example is about using Wikipedia, it's about using text. So the idea will be to bridge implicit and explicit metadata. So if you go to Wikipedia, you will find that there is the metadata on the right, but most of this metadata is encoded in the text. For example, that Picasso was born in Malaga, Spain. So in the following, we are not using this. So we are not using the metadata. We are capturing everything from the text. Because Wikipedia, just an example, we are doing this with other kinds of text. And let me remember how computers see things. And this is a very nice example done by Peter Mika, our semantic web expert. So this is the text. Pablo Picasso was born in Malaga, Spain. This is what the computer sees, right? Garbage. Hmm? Information retrieval puts everything in a, in a bag of words, and so it's a bag of garbage. And it works. 90% of the problem solved. Doesn't matter the order, doesn't matter what it means, 
it works. Syntax is enough. Then natural language processing people, they see still the same garbage, but they know that some parts of the person, some parts of locations. So they know the entities. And then of course we would like to, to do this. What do you see inside your brain? So this is a person, a painter of 20th century, was born in Malaga. Malaga is a city in a country. All these relations. This is the hard part. That's the semantics part. So here is the famous semantic gap. So this should be like way above, and here we have the semantic gap between computers and people. Hmm? But you can use other tricks to extend metadata. So for example, if most artists are persons, then let's assume all artists are persons, okay? Yeah, maybe we include a dog and one elephant. Doesn't matter, they are persons for now. Most cases are true. Or if most places of birth are locations, then let's assume all are, and this is true. Why we need to do this? Because the data is incomplete. The data is with mistakes. So it's not uh, homogeneous. So you can extend metadata. And now you can take every sentence. For example, here each one of these nodes is a sentence. And relate that sentence to all the entities on that sentence. For example, this sentence is about Pablo Picasso and 1906. And also Gertrude Stein. But it's another sentence that talks about Pablo Picasso, October 1881. And also another sentence that talks about October 25, 1881, the, the date of birth. And then from this bipartite drive, you can delete the sentences and get to this, just the entities, related by sentences. So two entities are related if they appear in other sentence, and that's related to other entities because they appear in common sentences. So this is a real example for Picasso. So dates are in red, and all other entities are in black, so people and places. This is a real shape of the graph. So you have a big connected component, and you have many, many unconnected components, which are more strange things. So this is the head of the distribution. This is the long tail of the distribution. <coughs> and then, with this, uh, the team led by Hugo Zaragoza did correlator. <coughs> you can also find the sandbox. Correlator is a tool to find related things in Wikipedia, so in knowledge. And the main interesting thing that this is done on linear time entity detection with competitive quality, so it's state of the art. But it has to be linear because that's the only one you can scale, so for example, to the web level. So what do you get? Suppose you go to, you, you query Albert Einstein, and you get the view of the Wikipedia entry. So this is just the Wikipedia entry, not too interesting. But let's click on related names. And here you see the change of interface. So here you see, you don't see this, but it's a social network. Where, for example, Albert Einstein is related to, uh, say, Helen, Helen Dukas. And if you mouse over here, you put the mouse, this will appear. These are the top three sentences that make us believe that Einstein is related to Helen. And basically, Helen Dukas was his assistant. In fact, one of the entries is their own entry. So what about related places? You get a map. You mouse over one of the balloons, say Montgomery, so you mouse over and then we'll expand to Montgomery, and automatically you will see here the set of sentences of why we think Montgomery is related to Einstein. And the reason there is that there's a high school called uh, Einstein in honor of him. What about related dates, related events? Well, you get the timeline. You get the timeline two ways. Horizontal timeline that you can scroll, or a text vertical timeline that you have all events from Einstein. If you click in any one of them, you will get the top sentence of why we think that is related to Einstein. Here the example is 1905 is related to Einstein because of the special relativity. So to finish this example, 
what happens if what you query is not in the Wikipedia? So for example, you say R Deco Chicago. So we can infer that R Deco is, a, is a, an entry, Chicago is another one, and then find the top categories in Wikipedia that match these two concepts. I will expand that. So basically, you have to rank a list of sentences, then you have to aggregate on the entries, so rank a list of pages, and then you have to aggregate on the category. So basically, you are doing aggregation hierarchically. And then you get, for example, for Art Deco Chicago, things like 1930 architecture or a sky curve in Chicago. Okay, let me give you another example. This is not from last week. I have been using this before going to Argentina. So these Argentina dinosaurs. There's no entry about that. But then we can know that one is about Argentina, one is about dinosaur. That's what matters in plural. And then you can get that the category related to this is dinosaurs of South America. And if you check, all these dinosaurs were found in the Patagonia. And if you don't believe me, uh, this one for sure is Argentinosaurus. Right? I mean, I don't have to check. That's, it's in the name. So let's go to the third example. Third example is about queries. I think the most interesting one and the, and the more potential. Well, one thing, what we learn here is that we can use this in good text. So you can use it in Wikipedia, you can use it in news, you can use it in some part of Yahoo Answers. You cannot use it in the web in general because people doesn't write good text. And also there's a lot of spam, web spam. So as I said before, queries are like implicit tags. For example, these are sessions, aggregation of sessions of people that are querying about Barcelona. So for example, Barcelona Hotel, one group go to cheap hotels, another group to go to luxury hotels. Some people want to watch the football team, and for some there are mistakes, uh, uh, a spelling mistake, and so on. So all possible ways to query about Barcelona. You can also have the click graph. So the click graph is similar to the previous graph I showed, with this bipartite graph of sentences and entities. So here, every node is a query, and here I, I separated one part of Italy, so for example, this is Roma, Roman Empire, so two queries are connected if there were two different people that click in at least one common page. Thicker the, thicker the edge, more people did that. For example, more people click in the same pages when asking these two queries. So here, for example, the thickest one, Rome, Italy. Uh, this was not normalized. Rome, Italy with a, with a comma, but basically the same query. So in, in previous, ex uh, after this, we did some normalization and we deleted the commas, but here we have the commas. So what you can do from the session graph? From the session graph, you can classify transitions in queries. So for example, you start with Barcelona, and then you type Barcelona because you corrected the uh, typo. Or you are talking about football, calcio, and then go to just Barcelona, and then you generalize. Or you are talking about Barcelona, and then you specialize, hotels. Or you specialize, again, cheap hotels. Sometimes you go from one topic to another, from hotels to calcio. So that's a parallel move. And then what you can do is this. You can do search path. So search path is a notebook, smart notebook, that will help you when you do research on the web. Research in the sense that you do this over and over in many hours or many days. You are interested in a topic, you are looking for a, an apartment, whatever. And here we use machine learning to trigger this. So we only offer you to help when you are, we are really sure that you need help in this topic because you have done it in the past. So it's not like this assistant that will say, you want help and really you want to shut up the system. So automatically you will get a, a small image, you will get the URL, and then you can take notes. And this is stored in your computer because it uses cookies, so it's completely private. We only trigger the application. 
So you need this for complex activities like uh, buying an apartment, illness, and so on. And this is already used by many people. We launched this in July last year. So what about the other graph? Well, if you think, if we are saying that these are implicit tags, we have like a falsonomy. For example, here are different clusters. The red edges will be equivalent queries. So basically, all the people click in the same pages. So for example, here you have the name of the bank and the website of the bank. Here we, you have TFCU and the expansion of the acronym, Teachers Fair Credit Union. This is from the US, so US State Department is the same as State Department. WCCA is the same as CAAP. So this is a court in Wisconsin that for historical reasons has two different acronyms, but it's the same. People know that. Some old people use one, some younger people use the other one. So green are a specialization. So for example, Yahoo China, this is kanji in Chinese, so language independent, is a specialization of Yahoo China, the site. Why? Because this site is in English and kanji, but this is only in kanji. So we can derive a dictionary. And we did that, so we derived a list of synonyms and a list of uh, specialized concepts, and we looked for them in the Open Directory project. So the idea was that if they were really OK, we will find them in the directory. And we find it. So red edges, 70% correct. We found that in the directory project. The specializations, the same. Related things, also there's some similarity, 20%. Random connections, this is the baseline, less than 10%. So this is completely significant. And this shows that we can derive interesting knowledge just from what people do. However, we were a bit sad because we lost 30%. What happened? Is 30% of the people wrong? Well, no. We checked by hand uh, around 400 random cases, and all of them were right. But they couldn't appear in the directory because they were too specific. So there were things that there's no information in the directory. Or things that are very specific in one language that doesn't appear in the directory. So basically, you can infer a lot of things from this. I will give you just two examples to finish. For example, if you look at this graph and you look at articulation points, articulation points also have a special meaning. For example, this one. Hard disk divides the world in two. One is about Maxtor, one is about Seagate. So division of the two main products. Or the world lonely divides also the world in two the world of traveling, Lonely Planet, and the world of music, all songs that have the word lonely in the lyrics. And then you can map the queries to, say, the open directory taxonomy. And you get this. The size of the font is how many people were interested in that type of query. So you can see that people is interested in arts, music, bands, and artists. No one is interested in arts organization. Less people is interested in this. I don't know what it is. You see? So let's do it the other way around. What really drives people? So let's do a hierarchical taxonomy over the queries. So the main driver of people is free, huh? even when it doesn't exist. But that's another topic. So to conclude, Many times, doubling the data improves everything. You don't need to work on the algorithm. Well, not quite. You need the same algorithm, but faster, because you are doubling the data. So scalability is one crucial thing here. So get the same algorithm faster is very important here. Maybe the same algorithm, 10 times faster, 1% worse. Very good. This is the example of the entity detection algorithm. I didn't show you more uh, examples from the, the queries, but basically the graph, for example, of entities, or the graph of queries is very similar to the graph of the web or to social networks graph. Why you have all these similarities? 
It's just because it mm, comes from something that humankind did, so there's something for the social, social, sociologists to uh, study. The example about checking our wisdom, for example, uh, against the human, human directory. We are using logs that come from 500 million queries, while the open directory has about 50,000 editors. So we have four times more wisdom from people. Maybe not the same people, but more people. So it's very hard to test these things, the wisdom of crowds, when you have a partial knowledge to compare. So you want to compare with WordNet, WordNet is very, sim very small. You want to compare with Wikipedia, Wikipedia is very small, and so on. And every day this problem becomes worse. Here we can do things like active, active learning and other things, but this is a problem. Every day we have more data and less things to compare that data. And finally, very important topic, privacy. So we're using, for example, anonymous query logs. But even though in anonymous query logs you can have privacy, privacy leaks. So really we are not interested in who are you. We are interested in what you are trying to do. So it's much better to contextualize your answer. For example, in all people that is traveling to Milano, they're trying to, to personalize your answer to you traveling to Milano. Because in most cases, we don't know who, are, who you are. We don't know how much you do. We know very little about your history. However, we know a lot about the, uh, the history of all people that travel to Milano, and that is much better. So we move away from privacy issues because you are hidden in the group. And this is very important because uh, bad news, although we are ordinary people with extraordinary taste, in the internet we are not that different. We all do the same. The difference is how much time we do everything, how good we do it, what time we do it, how happy we do it. But we all search articles, we all do queries we shouldn't do, and so on, right? So people is not that different. So to, to finish, the next step is what we call implicit search. You do something, we understand your context, and then we search for you. I will talk more about this tomorrow. I think Stefano will be interested. And for that, we need to do large-scale data mining. So for example, if you go to the main uh, entry of Yahoo, the news that appear are personalized to you, are contextualized to you. Not only Yahoo Italy, but also if you go to Yahoo US, that news will be different depending on who you are and what you are trying to do. So we are doing, optimizing that content. So the, the final goal will be that you go to the computer, you sit there, and you see the page that you want to see before doing anything. This will be the, the magic. We cannot do that, but we are trying to do something similar. So what we need? We need usage data at a very large scale. More data. We want to do contextualization. Not who you are, what you are trying to do. Help be, helping you in finishing your task, in being happy. We know that with of crowd doesn't work in small data. But more data brings privacy issues. So personalization endangers privacy, but, but contextualization doesn't. And that's the hypothesis we're using. Contextualizing hides you in the group. And then you have to comply with other legal regulations here. But these are the three driving factors in, in the research. So query intent detection, very important problem. Knowing that if you do a very simple query like MP3, you want to download music from your, for, 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 from your favorite group. And we don't know which group. So you can think that using all these techniques, we are creating a virtuous cycle where you improve the web. So these are the examples that I, I use. But you can think that each one is improving the web because you can generate new content like the Wikipedia example. We can generate new tools like the search pad example. We can generate new knowledge like the last query example. And this is the key issue for, say, the web 3.0.